So we're going to be looking at the, the proverb in its entirety. And so with that in mind, brothers and sisters, let's give our diligent attention to the reading of God's holy word. Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you search for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For... The Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who, lead, who leave the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. It will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the faithful, or the unfaithful rather, will be torn from it. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. As always, brothers and sisters, we're dependent on God the Holy Spirit. Now let's pray for his presence. Our great God and our Father, how we thank you for your word. Father, we are reminded that your word is living, it is active, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Father, it is your word that is the, the light unto our feet, the lamp upon the path that you have set us on. And Father, this morning we have come to hear from you, that your spirit would open up this very word upon our hearts and our minds. Father, we pray this morning that as the good physician, the one who works upon the souls of your people, we pray, O oh Lord, bless us now in these moments that we sit under your word. Send your spirit to apply your word to our hearts. Father, we know this morning that, that you know each of the hearts of everyone present this morning. You know the needs that each of us have from your word. And so we pray now, Lord, speak through your servant and bless us as your people. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, I would suppose it would be safe to say that it, it's an understatement to say uh, that September 11 drastically changed a lot about our country. And I would say, especially with military mindset. Uh, over the years, I've listened to a number of interviews of veterans who have served before and after and during September 11, and they will tell stories about how the military was before September 11 and how it changed to after September 11 when war was declared and we entered into Afghanistan and then, of course, later Iraq. And chief among them, they noted, the training became different. Uh, Pre-9-11, they took training seriously. You entered boot camp and you were assigned a role in your platoon. And yes, you took it seriously. Uh, but since we were not at war, uh, there, was a, a, there wasn't the weightiness that goes with it. There wasn't this life and death scenario that went with it. And so you could take it a little bit more, a little bit more lightly. But you see, post 9-11, that all changed. Suddenly now, boot camp and everything that went with it had a life and death scenario attached to it. Uh, those who were doing the training knew very well the men and the women uh, they were running through training would very likely be put in a position of life and death. Uh, these men and women who, who were in the training uh, realized that they also signed up during a time of war and therefore that training for them became all the more serious, all the more weighty because the intention was they were going to be sent into harm's way. 
In fact, interestingly, there became a term. It was called the September 12 mindset. Uh, a September 12 mindset meant everything changed because now we were in the global war on terror. In other words, when you prepare for war in the midst of a wartime, we learned this morning that urgency and weight comes to it. And I think that's fitting as we begin this morning to think on Proverbs 2 because that weightiness, that urgency, really runs throughout the whole text in Proverbs 2. Uh, the father here is speaking to his young son, his son coming to age. And if you look at your text, there's a number of wartime words and weighty words attached to this entire chapter. And the reason is, is because the father is preparing his son for spiritual warfare. The father is speaking to his son in spiritual training because he knows that as we live in this world, he will send his son out into the world and it is a world filled with contention with the, with the, the world itself, with our own flesh, and with Satan himself seeking to divert God's people. And so Proverbs chapter 2 comes with weightiness and urgency because the father knows his son will soon be set forth and he will encounter combat with all of these things. Uh, there is an utmost in a pri or there's an utmost priority being placed here on spiritual wisdom by the Father because his son's soul is at stake in whether he listens to his father or whether he disobeys his father. And so Proverbs 2 comes with a weightiness and urgency. Uh, it comes with this call to put godly wisdom with the highest priority because the world is filled with many snares of the evil one. And so even as we go through it this morning, right out of the gate, we know that it's the highest priority for all of ourselves as individuals. It's the highest priority for all of our children and how we raise them. And it's, of course, the highest priority of our witness in evangelism uh, to the world around us. Spiritual wisdom is of the utmost priority because we are in the midst of a spiritual war. Now, we need to understand the context, as always, as we dive in. And uh, the book of Proverbs was written to God's covenant people. And from beginning to end, the book of Proverbs is urging God's people to live a covenantly faithful life. Uh, there are numerous themes, too many themes for us to know, but the main theme, or one of the main themes, that runs throughout the whole book is two paths. You have the path of wisdom, the, the straight and narrow path, the path of the wise one, the path of the one who follows after his God. But you also have the crooked path, the path of the fool, uh, the covenant breaker, the one who rejects the God for whom he's in covenant with. And throughout the book of Proverbs, those two paths are held up, and the father is pleading with his son to cling to the straight and narrow path and to avoid the path that leads to destruction. And uh, we'll see those paths, of course, throughout this text. But it is God urging his people in covenant to be covenant faithful people to him. And here's a theme I want to consider with you with God's help. We learned this morning godly wisdom must have the highest priority in our spiritual warfare. Godly wisdom must have the highest priority in our spiritual warfare. I have three points outlining the text. First of all, we need to note the search of wisdom. The search that the Father urges the Son to take up. Secondly, the source of wisdom, who the Son is to seek this wisdom from. And then thirdly and finally, the security of wisdom. Uh, three ways that, that God's wisdom will grant protection from the snares of the evil one. So the search of wisdom, the source of wisdom, and then the security of wisdom. First of all then, Note with me then the search of wisdom. And right away in verse 1, the search of wisdom begins with parental instruction. Look at verse 1. He says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you. Again, we see the text, and actually if you read Proverbs 1 through 8 and 9, uh, you will see that the context is of this father speaking to his son coming of age. It is of a father speaking to a covenant child, urging that covenant son to receive for himself all of the promises of the God whom he is in covenant with. Uh, we see here the father speaking to his circumcised son, urging him to receive for himself his teaching and his words. 
Essentially, this can be put under one heading, discipleship in the home. The father is telling his son, listen, uh, you've been born and raised in a believing household. Your mother and I have spent hours opening God's word with you. You you know the ways of the Lord. And son, now as you're coming to an age of discretion, you yourself need to receive all that your mother and I have spent hours in prayer instructing you in. And we know here, especially the words of the father are at our Pointed, and, and this is the instruction of God. Uh, in your own time, you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where, where God comes through the words of Moses to parents, and, and He commands parents of covenant children to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. If you've read Deuteronomy 6, you know that, that throughout, parents are to have the Word of God always before their children. They're to bind it before their eyes. It's to be on the doorpost of their house so that when their children are rising up in the morning, it is the Word of God that they're hearing. As they walk about their way, it is the Word of God that they are hearing. And throughout the life of the children, it is the Word of God that parents are to instruct their children in. And especially Deuteronomy 6 says that parents are to do two things. Teach their children to know their God. The God who has marked them out as His covenant own. But especially Deuteronomy 6, parents are to teach their children to love the God that they are in covenant with. And you see, that's the backdrop to verse 1. The father has done this, and now he is telling his son, his covenant son, to receive and accept all of this teaching for himself. And so the search begins for this son with the covenant parental instruction he received from infancy on up. Now notice about the search, the commands for personal application. In verses 1 through 4, the father lays out action verbs for what the son is to do to get this wisdom. He's urging him. Notice, first of all, the the personal application is to the son's heart. Again, verse one and two. It says, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. The father says, okay, now here's the first step in seeking wisdom. You are to seek out, you are to store up in your heart, internalizing God's word for yourself. You could maybe even write uh, over your notes, internalizing by faith, personally, what he's been taught. You notice that the son must now personally accept and keep the commands in his heart. Uh, The idea of the Hebrew, the heart is both heart and mind. Uh, It is the whole being of the son. Uh, It is that he's received and is now is living outwardly and inwardly, according to what God has commanded. The son is to not simply memorize what the father has said, but he is, li- he is call- called to live according to what he has been taught from the heart. And you notice the imagery here as well. I think this is fascinating. He says, turn your ear and listen. Uh, this imagery is of, of truly hearing, of truly listening, not just hearing and forgetting, but, but turning your ear, inclining, with this imagery of catching all that his parents have said so that it reaches his mind. As I thought on the imagery of this, I'm reminded of what my wife often says I, I'm not good at. Uh, there are times where she will tell me I'm not turning my ear to what she's saying. Uh, she'll look at me and she says, did you listen to me? And I'll say, of course I did. And she says, what did I say? Well, I probably didn't turn my ear as much as I should. You see, the father is saying, don't just listen. Turn your ear so that it seats and it takes root in your heart, in your mind. Listen, take heart, apply God's word to your heart. Next step in this application is study. Look at verse three. It says, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding. Again, notice the father has said, now it's up to you. I've trained you up to this point. Now you are to take an active role in study. You are to take the active role of pursuing wisdom. You are to take the active role in asking those who know and apply what they say. The Father's calling the Son to seek out godly wisdom for Himself. Uh, By this, He just simply means studying and asking questions in order to get the answers. Uh, I think we could add or say that what He means is diligently seeking truth from God's Word. 
Uh, what the father is saying is, listen, your time of seeking wisdom does not end when you graduate from high school. Uh, your time in seeking growth of wisdom does not end when you get married or you enter your 30s. This is a lifelong pursuit until the day you die or Christ comes back of where you are constantly studying, constantly seeking, constantly growing in the wisdom of God. You know, by the way, as an aside, that's one of the reasons why the Reformers emphasize catechism. One of the reasons they emphasize the study and the memorization and, and the, the pursuit of wisdom through these teachers of the church was to be obedient to this command. That our children from infancy on up and in adult Sunday school and on up would be constantly doing what God says to do here. To grow, to study, to seek out for ourselves through diligent means, godly wisdom. And then fourth, or the third rather, application is to see wisdom as valuable. Look at verse four. It says, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. The father is telling his son, listen, you have to have a, a, an aggressive nature to this. You have to see that wisdom is the far most valuable thing you could possibly get. The father says, son, you need to look for this like you would look for lost treasure. You need to look for wisdom as for the lost gold that you've lost in your house. You need to pursue it as the most valuable thing that you can have in your life. Uh, the Father is telling the Son here that knowing God through this wisdom, gaining this godly insight, this godly wisdom, is the most valuable treasure the Son has to pursue in his life. You know, believers, just as you and I would pursue a lost $100 bill that we left in our, our billfold and got lost somewhere in the house, the Father is saying, pursue God like that. Pursue Him like there was value in it because there is value. And so we learn here that, that eternal life is at stake. And I would say to this, if eternal life is at stake, there is nothing more valuable in this world than gaining godly wisdom. Pursue it like silver and gold. And here's the point by the application here. The father's telling his covenant son to personal application to take steps on his own as he leaves the home to walk with God on his own. And then notice verse 5. And part of the search is that there's a promise of understanding. Verse 5. The father says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now notice the grammar here. In verses 1 through 4, there's this if statement. Numerous times the Father says, if you do this, if you search, if you seek it like gold, verse 5, then, then God will give to you two things, fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. The Father is saying, if you do all of these things faithfully and sincerely, then God will grant you a fear of himself. And of course, we know that the theme of Proverbs is that the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. Uh, the fear of the Lord is an important word. It, it means for the, the covenant person, uh, reverence and awe before the holy God to whom knows them. To have fear of the Lord is not a trembling fear to approach God, but it's this reverential awe that this God knows you and loves you, and you do not want to disappoint Him. Father saying, if you pursue godly wisdom through the means I just said, then there will be fear of the Lord in you. This relationship between you and God will flourish, and you will gain the knowledge of the Lord. As you pursue Him, God will reveal more and more about Himself to you. You will grow to know Him more, grow to love Him more. And I think this is even more beautiful when we understand that, that in the Bible, to know someone and to grow in knowledge of someone means to grow in intimacy with them. The Father is saying, as you pursue God, God will reveal more and more of himself to you, and your heart will expand with more and more knowledge and love and affection for this God to whom you are in covenant with. And so the Father here is saying that if you do these things, God has a promise in store, then he will reward those who seek him with fear and understanding. And so what is the point this morning for the seeking of wisdom? I think here's the point. The father's encouraging the son to seek the wisdom in the Lord as a covenant child. Now, we'll get to this in the application at the end, but already now we need to note that, that this morning, this applies to all of us as parents. Uh, we are reminded that the book of Proverbs is really a, a study guide for parents in how to raise their children. 
And for any parent who has stood up here or in another church and baptized their child, you are reminded this morning of the vows that you and I took. That as the mark of God was placed on our children, we were reminded that God formed a covenant relationship with them. And we as parents entrusted with these children took a vow that that God's word would be opened in our home. That our children would be led on the path of wisdom in our home. That the children that God has entrusted to us, well, they would be discipled, they would be admonished, they'd be taught with God's wisdom and God's word. So as they come to the age of discretion, They themselves would leave on their own by a profession of faith and receive for themselves all that they've been discipled in. See, Proverbs 2 is highlighting the son is is taking that step out of his own, a profession of faith, as you will, to claim God as his own, the God who has marked him out. And so this morning we learned as parents we are to raise our children to personally apply, personally receive for themselves the teaching of the word of God. So that's the search of wisdom. Notice with me, secondly, the source of wisdom. Where are we to find this wisdom? Or maybe better, who are we to find this from? Well, notice it's from the Lord and his gifting. Look at verse 6. It says, for or because the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So now the, the father turns a corner. He says, listen, if you do all of these things in the search for wisdom... God will give to you, God will give to you uh, all that you stand in need of. He's adding to the promise of understanding that the Father will give wisdom and from his mouth will grant what is needed. Now, a couple of thoughts on this verse. First of all, with the fact that it's gifted, we are reminded this morning that true wisdom does not come naturally to us. A true wisdom cannot be found by ourselves in the world. True wisdom is not something we could work up in ourselves. True wisdom is something that must be gifted to us from God. Of course, we know the reason for this is because as sinners, we are born blind. We are born with a heart darkened to God. Apart from God's gift, apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts, we would never have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so the father who knows his own heart and the father who knows the heart of his son says, listen, do not forget, son, that I know what's in your heart as is in my heart. You need God's grace of gifting to give you this wisdom and this understanding. And I think the other thing to understand, or the other thing to note about this, is is from the Lord comes wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge. I think what the Father is driving home is that he knows God's character. In other words, that he's not sending his son out on a wild goose chase. He's not sending his son out with his fingers crossed, hoping that if his son actually pursues God, maybe, just maybe, God will give it. No, no. The Father says, if you do this, I know God's character. He's a God who delights to open up his word to his people. He's a God who delights to open up the heart of those who seek him. He's a God who delights to reward those who faithfully pursue him. And the last thing to note here is that the son is to find the source of wisdom from where? From the mouth of God, from the very word that exhales out of God. That is nothing short than the scriptures of the Bible that we have in our hands. The son is to pursue that knowing God's wondrous grace. And then notice about the source of wisdom as well, the Lord's protection, like at verse seven. It says, he holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. The Father here now turns and he says, as you find this source of wisdom, with this gift comes God's protection. And just notice the warfare language here. He says, God will give the victory. God is your shield. He will guard. He will protect from beginning to end. God will protect. God will bless the Son as he is on the path of pursuing wisdom. This is protection from the world, the flesh, and the devil. We learn here that God watches over those who are his. I'll be reminded of what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, that no one, no one can pluck his own from the Father's hand. What the Father is reminding his son is that God is sovereign, that as he walks on this path, Satan himself cannot divert the son ultimately. Satan himself cannot remove the son from the hand of the Father. God watches over 
those who are his own, those who are pursuing him, and he will protect him. We learned this morning, we're going to see more in a moment, that the only secure place in this world is in the, under the sovereign hand of the God whom we love. And then the last part about the source here, notice that the Lord's application of it to the heart of his son. Verse 9, it says, Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, for wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Uh, notice some of the language here. The Father says it will be the Lord who will apply it to you. It will be the Lord that will give you a pleasant taste for the word. The more God opens your heart, the more God will apply to your heart all of these things so that you grow in understanding. In fact, you, you notice some of the language here of, of justice and truth. The idea is that the son's eyes and heart will be open to rightly understand the world he is living in and be able to rightly apply these things to him. I think to put it in different language, what the Father is saying is with your new heart, God will cause it to flourish and grow and you will understand more and more God's wisdom in the world that you are living in. It will become pleasant to your heart. And I think here's the point. As the Son internalizes this wisdom, God's grace will grow him and transform him accordingly. In other words, maybe to put it this way, the Father is saying, Son, you're not on your own. God is walking with you. You're not on your own, son. God will apply what you need. You're not on your own, son. As you go through this life, as you walk this path, who's your travel companion? It's God. You know, as we send our children out, I, I have young kids yet. I don't know what it is to send my teenager out in the world. I know I'm going to be a failure at this. I'm kind of a hovering parent. But we know that as hovering parents, how can we let go of our children? How can we entrust their future without our control? God. Knowing that God will be with them. God will watch over them. When they fall flat on their face as we did ourselves, who's going to pick them up? God. Who's going to be with them in the trials and the sorrows and the heartbreaks that will certainly come in the lives of our children? God. Our God is the faithful travel companion who never leaves or forsakes us. And so the Father lets go of His Son and He entrusts His Son into the faithful, secure hands of the Almighty God. And so the son goes out on with God. Now, notice thirdly and finally, the security of wisdom. The father ends now, really with themes he's going to spell out later on in Proverbs, but with three ways or three particular avenues that God's wisdom gives security and protection in this life. The first one is security from the ways of the wicked. Look at verse 12. It says, wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who lead the straight path to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong, and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked, and who are devious in their ways. It's almost as if the father says, listen, son, I know the world that you're heading out into, and listen, if you give yourself over to God's wisdom, it will guard you, it will give you protection, from the deceitful, deceitful schemes of wicked men who will try to twist you off the path, get you to follow them in the ways of evil. Uh, you notice here the, the, the description of evil's men whose talk is with twisted words. Uh, they lie, they, they form about themselves their own truth about the world they are living in. Uh, these are evil men and women who have dark sinful motives and who are devious in how they want to live and build their life. And you understand this morning that the father is telling his son of these extreme dangers of the world. What does the world want from our children? What does the world want from us? It wants our hearts. It wants our thoughts. It wants to shape our worldview from God's worldview to their worldview. Notice something here. The emphasis is on the words. What is godly wisdom going to protect the son from? The deceitful, perverse words of the evil men and women. In other words, the Father's saying, if you know God's word, if, if God's word is internalized, it will shape your mind in such a way you will see through the lies, the schemes, and the twisted paths of the world that it wants you to join them on. Christian, this morning, let's be real. The world wants the hearts of our children. What is being taught in the schools, what is being taught in social media and movies is to shape our children's mind away from what God would have them to do. 
And the few years that we have with them in our home is to mold them and shape them in such a way that as they encounter these false worldviews, they will notice that's wrong. Why? Because God's word says something different. You know, when they encounter friends who would say, let's do this, Let, let's go this path, there'll be a ringing in their ear and their conscience, this is wrong. Why? God's word told me so. See, that's the Father's hope here. The Father's saying, you need to know God's word so much that when these perverse words are spoken to you, they may sound right, they may have a, a, a glimmer of truth, but listen, you need to know God's wisdom so much that the falseness of it will stand out to you. You see, this morning, this word has much to say about what we have to do with our children. Prepare them for the evil dangers of the worldviews that are vying for the hearts of our lives or children. You know, wasn't it true that if, if you paid attention the last two years with everything that's gone on in the public school, this is what's changed. People have listened to what the curriculum has been, and they've woken up to the fact that there's no neutral information. The world is teaching our children to get them off the path of the Lord. How are we to prevent that? Training and instruction, guiding them in the ways of the Lord so that when they hear the perverse words, they will understand this is wrong. So it will protect us from the ways of the wicked. Second way of security is to protect the son from the temptation of the adulteress. Look at verse 16 and 17. It says, it will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her, and notice this, it's important, seductive words who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. The second way of security is where the father is preparing the son for the seductive temptation of adultery, the seductive temptation of marital unfaithfulness uh, with an adulteress who would seek to divert him from the path. You you notice actually chapter 5, there's going to be more of a description of this adulteress But you notice here what stands out about her is that she's unfaithful. Uh, She's unfaithful to her own vow, to her husband, and she's unfaithful, notice this, to her own God. This is not an unbeliever. This is not a pagan adulteress. This is someone who grew up in the church, wandered away, and she's now trying to divert the son away. And notice, how does godly wisdom save, or, or maybe to put it better, what does godly wisdom save the son from? Notice again, the emphasis is on the words. Her seductive words. God's word, God's wisdom is to take such a root in the heart of the son that when he hears that alluring, seductive temptation, the words of this adulteress, his conscience will be pinged and the word of God will ring true. And he'll say, I cannot join you in this. Why? Because I know that what my flesh wants to do, what sounds so alluring to me, is not right. God's word has warned me. What has God's word warned him of? Well, look at your text, verses 18 and 19. We don't need to read it for the sake of time. But notice, God's word has prepared the son to note the painful outcome and the painful consequences of what adultery and sexual morality leads to. The word of God makes very clear the father is telling the son, listen, do not go with her, for her path leads to death. If you join her in this, it may give you temporary pleasure for a moment, but the end is actually ruin." You see, the son can ward off this alluring temptation, the words of the seductress, because the word of God and the warnings of God's word bring true. The son will be prepared to fight that temptation by resisting, by knowing, God has given me good things. He's never led me astray. And if I go with you, my ruin will be sure. So we learned this morning, we are to prepare our children for the seduction, the sexual temptations of the world around us. God's wisdom must take such a root in the heart of the son that when he hears these words, he will see them as the lies of the evil one that they are. And again, just as an aside, I I think it's safe to say as well that in our sex-crazed culture, parents, this is necessary. Our children are facing temptations online, at school, and all around. The words of the evil one seducing our, even our own hearts and our children's hearts are ever around us. Let us prepare our children for this. Let us warn them from a young age of this. Let's not only hold out the warnings, but also the blessing of covenant faithfulness. So when it will come, and it will come in the ears of our children, they will hear enough of it to know to turn away. So temptation from the adulteress will be rejected. Notice lastly, security in the land. Verse 20. It says, Thus you will walk in the ways of good men, 
and keeps the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Uh, the final grounds of security is that the son will live long in the land the Lord, the God, the Lord his God is giving him. Uh, we're reminded that in this time in covenant history or, or redemptive history, God had put his people in the promised land. And in the book of Deuteronomy, God says, if you're faithful, I will bless you. But listen, if you're unfaithful, if you reject me, if you break this relationship we are in, I will bring in foreign armies and they will punish you, they will discipline you, and they will take you from your own land and you'll be removed out of it. And if you know your Bible well, you know that that happened numerous times throughout the book of Judges, whether it was Assyria or Babylon, when God's people did not hold to wisdom but actually rejected God, what did God do? He removed them from the land. They lost their inheritance until God in his mercy brought them back. That's exactly what the son is warning him of. He says, listen, son, if you actually take in your heart the wisdom of God, God will bless you if you are faithful unto him and you will remain in the promised land and you will inherit it with God's people. But don't miss the warning of the text. The father holds back nothing. Notice what he says, but son, listen, if you actually reject God, if you reject what your mother and I taught you, if you turn your back on God, don't miss this, son. God will judge you for that. But if you reject the covenant of God you are in relationship, God will remove you from the land. Ultimately, the bigger picture here is of the promised land being the new heavens and the new earth. The promised land that we are still waiting for, where we will dwell with God forever. Here's the warning. If you reject God, there is an eternal consequence for that. There is judgment for that. And the father wants blessing for his son, so he urges his son, trust God and you will be secure with God for all eternity. And so we learned this morning that God will grant security. He will protect those who are near to him, but to those who reject his covenant, they will bear the discipline of the covenant. Now, you would ask, by the way, as we come to the point of conclusion this morning, where's the gospel in all of this? Where do we find the hope of the gospel? And I think here's the tie into the cross of Calvary. Proverbs 2 points us to the only place security can be found, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Proverbs 2 screams the need for you and me this morning to have a Savior, a Savior who has died on our behalf, a Savior who has walked the path of wisdom. This morning we learn that the pursuit of wisdom is a pursuit of Jesus himself. Isn't it interesting that Jesus in John chapter 1 is called what? The Word of God. 1 Corinthians 2 says that Jesus himself is wisdom. See, Proverbs 2 says that we are to pursue the Word of God and wisdom. Who is that? That is Christ. Where are you? Where am I to find true wisdom today? In our pursuit of wisdom incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, we are to teach ourselves, we are to teach our children to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only human being, the only covenant son, who was perfectly faithful from beginning to end. He was the one who was faithful to his God who lived the perfect human life. And we are to pursue Christ also because as the covenantly faithful son, he endured the curse of the cross and was cut off from the land of the living. You know, as we end, there's that warning that the unfaithful will be removed from the land. That is exactly what happened to Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The faithful son who was absolutely sinless was cut off from the land of the living. Uh, there was a, a darkness that overshadowed him. He was forsaken by God the Father. Upon the Son, he was experiencing the covenant curse of all of his people. You see, Christian, this morning, that is the only hope that you and I have. Because we have been unfaithful, we need one who was faithful. Because we have been sinful, we need one who has paid for our sin. That is the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And so as we come to a complete close this morning, we are called to seek him we're called to look for him, him who has bore the curse on our behalf. So two things in conclusion. First of all, we learned this morning that each of us personally must seek and know the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you personally, do you know the Lord this morning? Do you know the Lord as the word and the wisdom? Has he transformed your heart? Are you growing in love for him? Are you growing in knowledge of him? Are you growing in your relationship with him this morning? See, Proverbs 2 holds out, and I want this to be absolutely positive this morning, this huge promise that you are not on a wild goose chase, Christian. 
If you are faithful, if you pursue after God through His Word, through the worship here on Sunday, God says, I will reward you abundantly. I will open up the heavens and I will show myself to you more and more. Let us be encouraged this morning that where we may be falling short, where I may be falling short to turn our ear, perhaps we need to recommit ourselves in some ways. But let us be reminded that the promise of the text, if we do that, God will surely bless us. Let us seek the Lord where, where He is and let us know Him for God has promised to give us understanding. So we are each called to personally do this. Secondly, we also learned this morning that our, uh, us as parents, us as fathers especially, and us as households are to put God's wisdom as the paramount treasure of our children's life. Uh, the book of Proverbs holds this out from beginning to end that the, the, the godly household has godly wisdom as the single most treasure uh, that the parents are seeking after. And listen, parents, this text teaches us that this is the greatest need of our children. To know God, to have godly wisdom is the eternal and greatest need of our children. So what's the application? For parents, and especially fathers, we are to set a pattern in the home that Christ is the greatest treasure. We are to do this by searching God's word. Uh, through family devotions, by opening God's word in our homes, instructing our children, being open and honest about our own walk with our children, showing them and setting them on the path, growing with them together. I would say as well that making worship and fellowship at church a priority will teach our children that when they leave our home, Sundays are important, and worship is important. Why? Because that's where I get to meet with God. We set that up as a priority so that as children from a young age realize this is important. Worship with our God. And to children who are present here this morning, children and young people, this text makes very clear you are to receive and personally apply this to our lives. Uh, this past week in men's Bible study, I noted this, but if you go through the book of Proverbs, equally are the commands for parents to disciple their children, is also equally are the children called to receive that instruction. Children, are you receiving the discipleship in your home? Are you personally applying it to your life? Are you, are you trying to not live like the world, or are you trying to live like the world? Are you giving yourselves over to the wor words of the world? Children, this morning, be reminded you are marked out by baptism as God's covenant children. Uh, the call, the urging of the discipleship in the home is to lead you to personally make a profession of faith, receiving these promises for yourself. And so, congregation, we are reminded this morning we are in the midst of a spiritual warfare. May our households and our own lives show the seriousness and the weight of that pursuit. Amen. Our gracious God and our Father, we pray, O oh Lord, for us as such weak and frail people. Guide us on the path as your word has promised. O oh Father, we are so prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. Father, bless us this morning that maybe we feel the weight of this text, the conviction of this text. We ask, O oh Lord, send your spirit now to apply it that we would experience the sweetness of it. And Father, we pray that as we go from here, resting in Christ, that you would fulfill the promise to grow us in that wisdom. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.